Got that turned on. I got some, you know, let me check my audio real quick. I always like to check my audio when I start up just to make sure I can see the audio meter moving, but I just want to make sure you can hear me. So I just do a little quick test um, to check the live feed and we're good. All right, welcome to JR's Woodshop. I'm Jeff and this is my woodshop. And this is episode 97 of my live streams, which is really crazy that I'm like by next Friday. No, maybe, maybe Friday. Well, it's the day after Thanksgiving, but yeah, I might be in the shop. So that would be like episode 100, kind of crazy, right? 100 episodes. Um, and yes, I'm doing the obligatory wipe my eyes as soon as the stream starts instead of before. I don't know why I do that. It's just a thing. But uh, anyway, thanks for uh, stopping in and checking out what I'm up to, which is a lot of little things. And I'm kind of in progress with some stuff. Uh, I had some, I had a roadblock yesterday, which really irked me. I'll talk about that in a second. And uh, some other stuff that's moving along, not quite there, working with the bases and such that... Uh, we're kind of in a transition point of finishing a lot of little things. Uh, one of the big major things that I did the, uh, the off day of my, when I wasn't live streaming was to cut all of the corners for these bases and get them all cut and sized according to what is needed to fit in here for the particular base and the partic particular machine that will go in there. And, uh, 
they're not all created equal, so I had to basically custom measure and cut them. And uh, I got that done. I got most of them glued in. I still have two that need to be glued. We'll do that today as well. I'll get those in glue. We'll take the other ones out of glue, kind of see where we need to go with those. Um, one of the things that's going to happen is I'm going to do some grain filling on this uh, the zebra wood. I've got two bases that are zebra wood. This is zebra wood. It's really pretty. It actually looks really nice right now because I have sprayed this with a couple of coats of shellac. And the reason that you uh, spray the shellac, I didn't even turn these cameras on. I'm going to have to go turn all my cameras on. The reason you spray the shellac is that, um, I don't know if this can show or not, but there are a lot of large open poured areas in this wood. I'm trying to see if I can just find an area that shows some of these really large, let me just find one. I think the other side has one. Yeah, right here. So this is um, right here. And I think you could see some of it right here. Okay, so, so see right here, this area right here. This is just like very large open, I mean like large, like I could stick pencil leads inside there. It's that, those holes are that large. And what I need to do is fill those areas with some grain filler. And I've got a new type of grain filler that I'm gonna be using. Uh, my buddy Bill from where I used to work recommended this stuff to me and said it's really good. And I've done some research and looked. Um, so this is the stuff I'm gonna use. It's called Aqua Coat. And it is basically just a grain filler. It's kind of a clear, well, it's not clear, but it's a colorless. And you can see it looks like this. And uh, we're just gonna scoop some of this in there and fill up all of these grain, open grain areas. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, see if we can get this thing to be filled and flat. So one of the first things it says to do in the instructions is to do some sort of like a sanding sealer. Um, you can buy sanding sealer that is specifically called sanding sealer, but it's usually shellac. <laughs> so I'm just using this, this is just clear shellac. It is uh, not um, uh, wax free shellac right here. And uh, the reason you do that is that in order to keep this stuff from just continually soaking into the, the wood in the pores is if you put a finished coat of shellac on I will be wiping off the shellac from the outside edges, but that shellac that got down inside the pore areas really creates a barrier between the wood filler and the surrounding walls of the pores and just kind of creates that, that kind of like stop for the grain filler to hit and then rest in there and fill up those gaps. So we're gonna, uh, I've already done that. This is dried, I sprayed this yesterday. It's very dry. I will hit that with a, um, a pad. I've got these little 3M like Scotch-Brite. Uh, these are for finishing. So this is kind of a fine non-scuffing pad. It's probably about equal to about 400 grit or so sandpaper. And I will clean off all the areas of this and then we will go ahead and apply the aqua coat. Um, this was sanded down to 320 by the way, which is what their recommendation is. So I sanded to 320, I vacuumed out all of the uh, the pores and everything that I could, and then I sprayed it with shellac, and we will go back and hit this with the grain filler. You probably have to do this process two or three times, depending on how deep the, uh, the pores are, but we'll give it a try and see, because I really want this to be a nice, smooth surface, and those, this is beautiful wood, but those open pores, I think, could be problematic to our process. So I want to I want to get that taken care of. Um, so what was I talking about? Oh, roadblocks, stoppers, things that have gotten in my way. Um, these are some of the little charcuterie board things that I've been making, and I got uh, I got to the point where I was ready to ready to do the epoxy. In fact, if you're, you're you can see I've got this big barrier of plywood right here, or not plywood, but uh, cardboard. Um, I was gonna 
have be all set up. I've got a little silicone mat here, which is really nice. So nice silicone mat for doing this on. And I have these uh, great big um, syringes that I got for part A and part B so I could get equal parts A and B. I ordered some new, some new epoxy right here. So this is uh, crystal clear resin epoxy. And there's part A and part B. This stuff mixes one to one, no special ratios. I'm not doing deep pours. I'm just filling in the, well, you can see here, I've got these carved areas that uh, I'm going to fill in. And uh, so those are going to get filled with black epoxy. And here's another one right there. So you can see that that monogram right there has been carved on my CNC machine. And then I'm going to fill that with black epoxy. And I actually even ordered these really nice little skinny, if I have one of these out or not, I thought I did. Um, I've ordered these little tiny um, syringes, which are really cool because they have these little teeny tips on them. So it makes it really nice for putting that epoxy in those little uh, engraved areas. So I was all set to do that. Got my little stick here. I, I got my little popsicle stick. I was all ready to mix that epoxy up and dye it black and then start filling all these letters. I've got six of these things I've got to do. And I couldn't find my black dye. I have no idea what happened to my black dye stain. I have um, transtent dyes, and I had three bottles of it up here. I've got a, an amber, a um, mission brown, and black. And black's the one I've used most often, but, and I probably had it out here on the bench last, but I can't find it anywhere. I mean, I cannot, I've looked all over. I've looked under my bench, around my bench, which is scary. I'm not going to lie. It's some scary stuff going around my bench, but I've looked all over, crawled on my dusty, dirty floor, got my knees filthy, um, looked everywhere I could in my shop. I looked in the cabinet where it's normally stored and it's not there. Um, I do not know what happened to my black dye, um, which really bugs me. I mean, this stuff is expensive. First of all, a little teeny bottle like this probably, you know, I don't know how many ounces are in there. But uh, a little teeny bottle like that costs like 25 bucks for this stuff. But a few drops goes a long way. I mean, how big is this anyway? These bottles are, um, of course they put stickers over, but it's two ounces. I think it's two ounces. Two fluid ounces, is that what it is? I think this is like two ounces. Yeah, two fluid ounces. So these are two ounce bottles. They're not very big, so I'll show you one right here. So this is one of them right here. This is the uh, Mission Brown. And I thought, well, you know, I could just do this in brown. That'd be okay, but nah, I really want black. I want this to be black on there. And that's what I had planned on. And basically all I had to do was mix my epoxy, drop some, bl some black into there and get it really mixed up well. And then suck it into a syringe and pour it into the letters. But no, I can't find my epoxy. And I'm very sad. Because like I said, this stuff um, was 20, well, when I bought this from Woodcraft, it was $21. Uh, I'm thinking it's now more like $23. Um, so pretty expensive stuff. And I, like I said, I just, I'm going to just keep looking around. Just keep looking. <laughs> any, any place where I haven't looked before, it's like, I don't know what happened to it. The, the only thing I can think, which... I, I can't even think how this would happen, is that it fell into my trash can um, because I still had a lot of it left. I had like a half a bottle left and I, I don't know what happened to it, but anyway. I'm very sad about that because it kind of like er, put everything on a, um, uh, put the brakes on, on this project. I had already sprayed, I sprayed these with, with shellac, just, just this half of it with shellac because when you're using um, dyes in epoxy, it can have a tendency to seep into the wood around where you're putting the epoxy. So in order to create a barrier, I sprayed these with shellac and then that'll get sanded off on the surface along with uh, any raised 
search um, epoxy that is outside of the fill areas. So those are on standby for the moment. Uh, I'm probably going to work on them this weekend. Um, I was hoping to be able to move a little bit further than that, but didn't happen. Can't find my black stain anywhere. And uh, I'm, I'm sure once I go and buy a new bottle, that that one will show up because that's just kind of the way things work. But uh, for right now, yeah, um, you can see it wasn't a big bottle. It should have been sitting like right around here. I thought, well, maybe it got knocked off and rolled under. I, I checked under my bench. I checked around the bench. I checked all the areas around. Um, yeah, can't find it. So anyway, um, that's kind of upsetting, but you know what? It is what it is. We'll move forward. I'll go get some more because um, that's the only black dye that I actually have. So I'll go get some more of that stuff and I will do all of this stuff this weekend. Um, what else did I get? Oh, got my jar of Odie's oil in. So this is exciting because I'm going to use Odie's oil to finish all of the bases that I'm doing. Um, these are, this is a natural finish. It's a, um, an oil and wax finish. <laughs> Excuse me. And so that should be pretty exciting. Well, you know, as exciting as a finish can be, but it should look really nice. And so I'm going to use this on all of these like this right here and give them all a really nice natural. So this would look about the same color, I think, when it's when it's all said and done, when I get the Odie's oil on there. But it will have a really nice, smooth, beautiful surface. I'm also going to use the Odie's oil on all of these. So these all get Odie's oil. It's a uh, food safe finish. And you just basically buff it in and buff it out. I actually got some white um, pads uh, for white buffing pads. They're kind of like the Scotch Brights, but they're a super fine, like a four aught steel wool kind of fine um, pads for, for making applicators and for buffing that into the wood. And then you just use a cotton towel to take it out. Anyway, so I got this. So that's nice. Um, let me put this back in the cabinet so I don't lose it. Plus, this is in a glass jar, which, I, I mean, makes me nervous to have glass jars in my shop because if they drop, that's trouble. But anyway, I'm uh, kind of at a standstill for my, uh, for my process that I was going to be in, which was the, the uh, filling of the letters on the charcuterie board. So I'm going to put all this stuff away for right now. I'm going to set it off to the side because honestly, I just don't want to have it in the way and have to deal with it. So I'm going to put this stuff on the, on the side over here and we will come back to that or I'll come back to that this weekend probably. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. All right. But in the meantime, like I said, we can work on, um, taking the stuff out of the clamps that is in the clamps and work on uh, doing some grain filling. I actually have two of the zebra bases and I think I mentioned that. It, the thing is that this one has been sanded to 320. The other one has not been sanded. So I haven't decided if I'm going to subject you to that yet or not. I'm going to put my silicone pad or my little mat away so it doesn't get all dusty dirty because ugh, my shop is dusty dirty. I also got little Bondo spreaders. So I've got some little Bondo spreaders here and they're great for doing the, um, doing the Odie's oil or for doing the, uh, the aqua, coat, aqua coat grain filler. So we'll be using that. I've got two more bases right here. These two need to be glued, have the corners glued in so the the corners are cut and ready to go. I just need to glue those in. So I'm leaving these set over here for just a moment because I don't have clamps and workspace to deal with these. Um, oh, let me get all of these charcuteries out of the way because I can't use them yet. Sad, sad, sad. Anyway, like I said, these have all been uh, sprayed with lacquer. And as soon as I get that black 
dye stain to dye the epoxy. We will be ready to roll on these. And then I can get these kind of moving forward. I'm just gonna set these to the side. For right now, they'll be safe. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. What's going on here? I've got my uh, cross uh, cut sled on the table because that's how I cut all of the legs. But I'm just going over here, making some space, and we're gonna pull out some of these other bases here. Now, one thing I didn't do this morning, which I normally, normally do this right away, but this morning I did not, was I did not turn on my other cameras. So give me just one moment here to pop these cameras on. And that way you can get a little bit of a view of what I'm doing over here. And we can kind of move on from there. All right. So let me switch cameras and give you a little bit better angle over here. There we go. So this is uh, how I normally, well, these are big clamps, but this is how I put all of the uh, corners in is I basically put a clamp on each corner, but I also use these little support clamps or support blocks behind the clamps to allow me to clamp in the corner and put the support in the right direction. And hang on a second, one more clamp to get out of here. And I'm not gonna use these clamps again. I've got other clamps I'm gonna use for this, but just wanna show you. So I use these little blocks like this, put those on the corners, and now I have a flat flush surface that is directly opposing but parallel to the flat side of the corner here so I can clamp across this way. And you can see that now I have corners in here. Um, some of these have the same species of wood for the corner. Some of them have different species. Um, this, I did not have the same species of wood. This is Paduk, so this is cherry in the corners, but I think it looks nice. Uh, this zebra, I used some, this is torrified oak but it's nice and dark and looks good. I also have a walnut on the other one has walnut uh, for the uh, corners. So it just depended on the base as to what I used. Um, this is a uh, walnut base and this has walnut corners. So let me take these clamps off and this has the same in the corners and these, the regular corners, I use those little blocks and they basically just have a V cut into them like this. And that just gives the ability to fit on that corner and then get that clamping pressure across. But on these longer corners right here, so you can see, uh, because I can't just clamp straight across because this is a flat face here. Um, what I did was I came up with these little L shaped clamping jigs that have notches in them that allow me to clamp on that same angle, but it actually hooks into the back of the base and gives me the ability to put pressure on those blocks and let them get firmly glued to the sides. Um, the thing about these, these blocks that I'm gluing in, these corner braces, is that they need to really get a good glue job done to them because they are what carries all of the weight of the sewing machines when they're glued in. But you can see there it is with the little blocks in the corners. And then here's these. Now this one is maple, so these match. So sometimes they match, sometimes they don't. But when they don't match, I try to make them something maybe contrasting in color. Um, there's this one with the lid. So this is basically, when you look at this, pretty much done. Um, I have one thing coming in the mail today, which is new um, 
new spindle sandpaper for my spindle sander so I can clean these finger holes out because they are just rough cut on the bandsaw. So I need to get those cleaned out. Like I said, I'm waiting for Amazon to deliver that stuff. So whenever Amazon gets around to bringing that stuff today, um, that's one of, the, one of the chores on my list. In fact, let's, uh, let's take a peek and see if they have given me any, they have not given me any updates. Sometimes they deliver early, uh, but not always. What? Stop it. So let's see what they say for delivery times. I'm sure it'll be sometime this afternoon. Uh, let me check my orders. That's what I want. And yeah, by 8 p.m. So there you go. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it'll be 8 p.m. Sometimes they say by 8 p.m. and it comes at 10 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes they say 8 p.m. and it gets here at 9 p.m. So is what it is. But those are, like I said, those are um, those are coming, and I've got new ones uh, in 120 and 150, I think, is what I ordered, because I need them for my spindle sander, because I've worn my other ones out, and they are not any good any longer. So I'm gonna set this right here for a moment. I'm just setting good bases over here, so we can continue to take clamps off. So here's another large base. And this has those L-shaped brackets on here. Let me come back to this camera. So you can see this has the L-shaped brackets on here as well. Um, just gonna turn my, gonna save a little power there, and turn the brightness down on my monitor. But these things, I have multiple notches in here because sometimes uh, depending on the length of this base uh, and the length of the storage, I need to have a different clamping pressure in a different spot. So some of them have multiple notches in them based on what I've needed. Like this one just has one notch in it and it seems to work well for these larger bases, but not always. So that's why some of them have multiple notches in them. This is a Sapili base. Oh, and this one actually is kind of cool. So the Sapili base, I actually glued up some Sapili boards that I had, some scrap, made some uh, some board glue ups, and oh, let me grab it. So I came up and made these little triangles. But this is actually made from two boards. There's a seam. I don't know. You probably can't see it, but let's see if I can get close here. So there's a seam that runs up the middle of that, right there. And this is actually just two boards glued together and then trimmed down and cut into those, those little pyramidal triangular shapes. And uh, yeah, they look really nice. They, they, they match the, the wood grain. They look really good inside there. So I did a couple of those. I've got one base. I haven't glued them in yet. Um, this one's giving me fits. This is for a different machine. This is for a smaller machine. These are giving me, this base is giving me fits because I, for some reason, the, the machine does not want to fit in here and I can't figure out for, I can't figure out why. I can't figure out what is going on, why it's rubbing or touching or hitting. Um, so I have to figure this out before I put these corners in. It may be something in the front here, but I need to make sure this fits the machine before I glue these in. Because if I need to change something to the shape of this, um, I will not have that opportunity once I glue these corners in. It's all ready to go, the corners are set. Um, but this one is gonna wait a little bit until I figure out what's going on and what's goofy with that one. Uh, which might take a little while. And I'd rather not hold up everything I'm doing just because I've got one base that's being stupid or because I'm being stupid about one base. Take your pick. They're probably both right. All right, more of these corner clamps, uh, these blocks. I keep these, I just have a box that I throw these into and I come back to them because I use them all the time. Every time I make one of these, I'm gluing corners in until I come up with a different method uh, of supporting the machines. 
I just keep these things stored in a box and just haul them out when I'm done. Uh, this base looks really cool. So this one has, this is the other zebra wood. This one also needs to get grain filled, but I have to sand this down before we go there. And that's a lot of sanding. I don't know if I want to bore you with all that sanding because I start at 80, then go to 120, then to 150, then to 220, and then to 320. <laughs> that's a lot of sanding for this base. And I don't want to bore you with that. But this is, this is a cool one because... Like I said, zebra wood, and then I have these two different style of lids that I made for the storage. So this one has two strips of maple in there, which I thought kind of cool looking. So we've got that one. So it gives a look like this to the base. And then there's also this one, which is just laminated pieces of zebra wood, but gives a look like that. So both of these are gonna get included with the base and uh, they can, uh, whoever the owner is, can decide which one they want to put in, but that's a little bit of a higher end upgrade for these. All right, so that is everything out of the clamps now. They are all setting to the side. The, uh, let me take this one for example, because it's pretty much done. So something like this that is pretty much done, what I need to do for this is um, basically sand the edges down. These are pretty nice. They don't have a lot of tool marks. So I'll probably sand this for 120 and then 150. Um, and then what I will do is after 150, I will give the entire base, the bottom, the top, and the inside of this space right here will get a eighth inch round over. I do that after I do the 150 sanding because if I did it first, if I did the round over first, the 120 and the 150 might remove too much wood to make it look like you would lose that profile of the eighth inch round over. So I wait till I finish the 150, then I do the eighth inch profile all the way around, um, the round over, and then I will go back and do this at 220, which is where I normally stop. Um, if I'm doing uh, uh, you know, my regular finishes, but because I'm using the Odie's oil, I think Odie's oil suggests sanding to something like 320. Um, and you can actually, uh, it doesn't say right on here, but I've read the, the online instructions. And the key is to these, the, the more you sand these things, uh, the finer you sand them, the higher the sheen of the, uh, of the finish. So if I took this and sanded it to something like, I don't know, like a thousand grit, um, it would be a very shiny finish. Um, if I do it to 220, it'll be like kind of like a satin matte finish almost. So you're, you can control the amount of gloss or sheen that you get by how fine of a sandpaper you use on these. So I'll probably take these to 320. Um, so that's my next thing. So like I said, I'll do the 120, 150, do the eighth inch round over, and then hit it 220, 320, and then do the Odie's oil finish on there. So that's what is up with these. Um, yeah, all right. So let me get uh, this base right here. Let's go ahead and do a glue up of this base because we have the pieces. We have the corners right here. So I've got four of these right here. They've all been cut and fit. Um, the only thing I'm gonna do is maybe get a piece of sandpaper here and clean up the edges of the corners. So I usually like to just, like where there's fuzz from where they were in the, you know, cut by the saw. I just wanna make sure there's no fuzz right on the edges. Um, I do not sand the end grain of these. I, I just don't find that to be necessary. Um, like I said, I'm just looking to remove fuzz. And then the other thing that I want to do is check the fit. Even though these should be nice right angle 90 degree 45s, my joinery, not always 100% perfect. It could be off by half a degree or whatever. And so when I look at these things, I want to see that they fit squarely in. Now this one actually is 
got a little bit of a wobble to it. I'll come over here and give you a close up so you can see. Okay, so if you see this corner right here, it has a, a little bit of a wobble. And I don't know if you can see that or not. Just a tiny bit of a wobble. Now, in order to get rid of that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sand this down and I have a piece of large, like 80 grit sandpaper that I just put on the tabletop here. And all I wanna do is remove a little bit of wood back towards the, the right angle at, at leg of this. You can't even see that, can you? Um, where am I? There we go. So all I wanna do is remove, so here is the, the offending triangle. I need this to be just a slightly less or slightly more, um, I can't even remember the name, obtuse angle. Anyway, I'm gonna sand so that most of the pressure is near this back edge. That will widen the angle just a little bit and make it fit just a little bit more securely in this corner. And all I'm gonna do is hold it so that when I put pressure down, it's gonna put it over this edge, not this edge, not the thin edge. And I'm just gonna remove some of the material and then I'll flip it and do it on the other side. But I use like an 80 grit, just so it goes a little faster. And I'm not looking to move a ton of material off of here. So that side, then I'll do this side. Um, not a ton of material. But I do wanna keep that on this thicker edge. so that I get a really nice fit. I'll come back and check it. Now I don't have any wobble. It's nice and square in there. It looks really good. I say square, obviously it's not square. Otherwise I wouldn't have to do this. But uh, anyway, that's what I'm doing is just, I just wanna make sure that these things fit snugly in those corners. So when I put the glue in there, the glue will have nice flat wood to bond to. And that's the key. <laughs> I'm just cleaning up some of that sanding dust. All right, I'm gonna check this next one here. Like I said, I'm just cleaning the fuzz off of the edges. Because fuzz you can't get off. <laughs> After you've glued them in, you will not get the fuzz off. And I also just make sure that there's no glue or anything in that corner that will impede this from fitting. This one also has the wobbles. Sometimes if you flip them, they're not as bad, but it's it's not great. So I'm gonna do the same thing with this one. I'm just gonna work that thick edge and gonna take a little bit of material off of this corner. So that this thing fits perfectly in there. Now, once I get these in, they have to stay in these corners. I can't like switch them to different corners because I'm sanding these to fit a specific corner. So I just gotta make sure that I don't move these things around after the fact. Let's check that one. And it needs just a hair more. Let's do this side right here. Now this, like I said, this is a six inch 80 grit sanding disc. And um, it uh, is on this melamine surface, which is pretty flat. Get this edge right here. Just trying to flatten, make sure that this wide area is now flat now. And there we go. Okay, so I have two of them now that are perfectly fit. Move on to this third one. And basically the same thing. Just, they're all just rocking. They're all rocking. Um, now I do have a little bit of glue squeeze on this one. So let me find my chisel right here. So I've got a chisel. I'm just gonna take 
and run this down that seam to get rid of a tiny bit of glue squeeze out on here. And it's very minimal, but sometimes just a little bit is enough to keep things from fitting well. And this also is getting, you know, this is behind where the, uh, the block will be. So you wouldn't see where I'm chiseling here. And I'm not chiseling the wood per se, just any little bits of glue that may have landed back here that I didn't get out prior to. I'm gonna vacuum that instead of blowing it out because I don't wanna mess things up here. All right, I'm gonna go back and check the fit of this now that I have cleaned up that glue squeeze out, what looks to be, and it's closer now. Still needs a little, a little bit right here. Still needs just a little bit of uh, touch up, but much better than it was. Just cleaning these corners out as best I can here. Because anything that's in that corner is going to basically impede this from fitting, getting a nice flat flush fit inside there. Which like I said, is another reason why I just try to take these fuzzies off because they can kind of keep this from sitting flat in there as well. Let's try this again. All right, now I just need to work on Removing a little bit of stock from this, and we'll be good. And they don't all need to be done. It's like every corner I do doesn't need sanding, but sometimes just, I don't know, you're not as square as you want to be. That looks nice. We'll call that done. And we'll get this last one fit. And I know it needs a little work as well. I wanna check the corners for glue on this one as well because it was a little more wobbly than it should have been. And sometimes that's indicative of having a little, little bit of glue in that corner. Actually, this one, yeah, this one's really close. So we're just gonna uh, give this a little bit of touch up here. See how that looks. Perfect. All right, clean up my dust. Ah, uh, that's not good. I just blew my breaker. So that's why it looks dark here. So if you'll give me just a second, I'm gonna go back and turn on all of my lights again. I'm not sure why I blew a breaker but I did, so give me just a minute. I'll be right back. It's down in the basement, it is what it is. All right, well, that should be better. Doesn't happen all the time, but it can happen occasionally. Um, normally it happens if I have my heater on, not just when I'm running the vacuum, which is kind of weird. Um, 
but such is life in my small, under-electrified shop. Just, that's just the way it is. Luckily, I did not lose the live stream camera. So that's good, and the live stream feed should still be up. So, hooray for that, because that would have been sad. Um, all right, I'm gonna go ahead, like I said, and get these things glued in here. Now this is no storage, so basically I'll just be using four of these corner clamping pieces. Put them in there, put a clamp across here, good to go. These are the easy ones to do because there's no angles to work with. So I'm gonna keep each of these in their respective corners and I'm just putting a little glue on each side, rubbing it in with my finger. Um, the key I found to these to really kind of controlling the squeeze out is to keep the, the bulk of the glue near the back in the corner and then really, really light glue, just very light, like a really thin film right up here by the, um, by the edge. And then we keep most of the glue body, the bulk of it in the, the meat of the joint towards the right angle. And that really kind of prevents any sort of squeeze out um, because it's really hard to clean squeeze out out of the corners when you've got these braces in. And then what I'll do is just press it into place for just a second and now come back and clamp that. It doesn't need to be clamped right away. Uh, you can usually, I mean, it, it's where it needs to be and it's gonna set up and I'll come back and put the clamps on in just a minute but uh, just taking the extra glue off my finger, putting it onto this one, and then we'll do the same thing. We'll just give a little squeeze. Um, it does not take a lot of glue to get a good bond. It's like molecules of glue <laughs> needed to bond between wood surfaces. It's not much. I, I was hearing something from the, the type bond people were talking about this um, and talking about the the glue and how much is actually needed to get a good bond. Um, the really, the, the issue is, you know, the wood that you're gluing more than the glue that you're using because you want, once you have that glue bond, if you have failure, it's probably gonna be in the, the wood's glue, which is like what they call the lignin, which is the, the stuff that holds the wood fibers together within the wood itself. That's probably where you're gonna have a failure if you do have one, not in the glue itself, because the glue almost never fails. Now, if you don't get enough to where you don't have, um, you know, the surface covered, then yeah, you can actually get that failure at that spot, but that's not a glue failure, that's, a, that's user error. That's operator error because you didn't put enough to create that bond. So just super light spreading this. And like I said, really just a super thin film by the edges here. And that usually prevents me from getting any squeeze out on these edges, which is a-okay with me. I'm gonna clean those off. But you do wanna have like the, I do get the, I get it on all the surfaces, but some of them are super light. All right, let's get this one in here. Ah, I just touched it to the inside and that is no bueno at all. Because that glue will get in there and create a barrier with the wood. I'll have to sand that really quickly when, I, when it dries up a little bit. Um, yeah, you don't want to get glue on your sanded surfaces. It creates a barrier which prevents any of the um, any of the finish from getting and soaking into the wood. All right, we got one more to do, and then we will clamp all of these up. Come on, this glue bottle almost done. Getting near the end. I got one in the wings waiting to come on. All right. So yeah, I just push the bulk of the glue towards the joint or towards the corner 
and then really lightly up here on the edges. That's it. All right. Get this one set into place. Clean my finger off. Because no one wants a gluey finger. And now it's clamping time. So like I said, using one of these, I have I prefer these little F clamps. These are nice. These are they're Bessie, but you can everybody has little F clamps like this. Um, let me just check my chats here real quick. Um, you know, you can get these from Home Depot. You can get them from Lowe's. You can get them from Ace Hardware. You can get them from everywhere. I mean, they're just F clamps. Um, these are just happen to be made by Bessie. And I like Bessie clamps, but there's nothing unique or exciting about the construction of these. What I am going to try to do is have the pressure point, which is this round foot at the bottom, try to have that pushing in the middle of the uh, of the gluing area. And I want to have this top of the F clamp flush flat against the triangle face. And then we're going to clamp right across there. And then the other thing you have to be careful of is as you're applying clamping pressure, it can pull that wood up and you want to make sure that those pieces stay down and flush to the ground or to the, the bottom of the base. You don't want those to be lifted by any torquing created by the clamping pressure here. But that's really, that's what we're looking at is just simple as that. And we'll just go around the horn here and put clamps on. And like I said, I'm trying to put my clamp in the middle of the block here and in, in the about halfway down just to kind of make sure that this clamping force is evenly distributed. That. This one is pretty quick. Not as complicated as the one. We've got one that has a, uh, I saved one <laughs> to show you that has the, uh, the side compartment. So you'll get to see how that one is done as well. One more. This out of the way. And get one more block here. Clamp. In the right spot, get some pressure, and I'm just hanging it off the table because it's easier for to get my hand underneath it to clamp. I have big hands, so these small little handles not always great. Anyway, when we're done, it looks just like this. So you can see basically clamping pressure going straight across the faces of these blocks. They are all touching the floor of the base. I have a tiny bit of squeeze out on this last one. And I'm gonna get my little straw and I'm gonna just run that down in the corner and remove that squeeze out, just like that. Super clean, no other squeeze out to deal with. So I will set this aside and we will do the next one. I mean, honestly, those things, after a couple of hours, that glue's probably set well enough to be good for life. But I generally like to leave them in the clamps for a day or an evening, whatever you want to call it. But I would not address them again until tomorrow. Now this one, it's got a smallish feet. Um, I have a machine here that goes in here. I think this is the small base. Is this a small base? Hang on, let me check. Yeah, so this is a smaller base. Um, I have a machine here so I can show you how I actually check the uh, thing because I pulled this machine out just to do some checking. This is not the, I don't normally keep this machine out because this is a really super nice machine. And it's my wife's and she's nice enough to let me use these things, but it fits 
just like this. Um, there's a little wiggle room around the edges, the corners, whatever. Um, but that's how it fits in here. This is a hand crank machine. So you can see that the handle goes around like this. The machine sits inside. There you go. Um, the nice thing about the way these machines and these bases are set up is if you wanted to, you could flip this around, run your machine this way, and then you've got an extra work surface up here, which is why I like to make these lids flush to the surface. Now you're gonna have a nice smooth work surface right here. So if you're doing a wider piece of fabric and you're sewing through here, you've now got a nice wide bed of area here to run your stuff through. So that's why I like to make these bases the way I do. They're reversible. There's no hinges to go in here to keep it facing one direction. Um, so there you go. But that's how this fits. This machine and this is what's called a 99. There's also machines that have the same footprint. Um, there are there's a 28 and a 128 version. They have the exact same footprint. But what is different is the depth that they require. So I always have to make sure that when I make these, I get them deep enough from the, from the feet to the bottom of the floor here. They are deep enough that they will accommodate the inner machine workings that are under that, that machine bed there because the, the, the 28, 128 machines are set up differently than those. And so their mechanics underneath do not go down as deep. So they can sit in a more shallow base. That particular machine that I just used needs to have like almost two and a half inches of space in order to function. And so you have to be careful when you're measuring these things. If you're only using one machine, the footprint around the outside of the machine is the same, but that interior footprint, not so much. I was looking for my measuring tape right here. So yeah, so I ended up with um, two and three eighths inches of depth, which I just had that 99 machine in here. So you can see that it's plenty deep enough for this one. Um, but uh, now we need to get these glued in. So these corners, they're good to go. I am gonna clean off the edges of these, just like the other ones. They can get a little tear out from being cut. Um, the, so, whoa, pardon me. These are um, oak. This is uh, the Jatoba. I did not have any extra to Jatoba to use, so I'm using oak, which is actually kind of about the same color as the bottom of the base, so it's a nice contrast. Um, and what else? Yeah, that's about it. Oh, the other thing is, if you'll notice, like on the back of this, you can see there's like burning and such on the wood, but I don't really concern myself with that because the only face I care about is this face, which is what's gonna be actually facing the outside, and it is super clean and nice. So that's all we need to do is worry about that, not any burn marks that happen to be on the back of the wood from the saw blade. So now I'm just checking these for fit, just like the wobbles in the last one. Just checking to see if we have any wobble issues, which I don't see any. Just cleaning off the fuzz. Once I get these all checked, yeah, these are all really nicely fit. Um, we'll go ahead and get these glued up as well. Okay, last one. This one has a little wobble to it. A little wobble on this one. Uh, let me check for, there's no glue in there in that corner. That corner is really clean. So this one needs just a little cleanup on this edge. That's why I check them. So let me, uh, Hang on, and there goes my son. Okay, I uh, had to make sure he was up. When I went and turned on the power again, I made sure he was up.
So even though it looks like I'm sanding this entire flat surface here, I'm putting more pressure on this corner than I am on this corner so that it is kind of widening that angle to make it fit. And now it fits nicely. Hooray. All right. Time for the glue up. Now on these, like I said, I need these corner brackets like this. I need these L-shaped brackets to fit on the corners on, no, I'm sorry, not on these parts, but on these parts right here. So on these parts right here, this stuff is so splintery. Um, I will need that because I can't get a clamp to sit this way. So I need something opposite of this corner to clamp to. So I will use one of these and I'm just gonna check my uh, angle here to see. Okay, so this one right here works for this base, should. And then um, I've got another one right here, which should be adequate for this one. All right, glue time. Got a, that, that. So let's go ahead and get this glued up and get these on. I just prefer having these in. I, I, I was gonna finish these yesterday and I was like, well, if I do that, then I won't be showing any of the glue process and how I clamp these things. But I do have a lot of them that are done. I do wanna actually do a coat of clear coat, or not clear coat, but grain filler on that, uh, on that one zebra that's already been sanded. I wanna see what that looks like. So I'm gonna press this into place and just let it sit there and let that get tacky and set up. Um, and then we'll come back and like I said, we'll put the clamps on. I will clamp these before moving on to the other corners just because this is a little bit more of a challenging clamp up and it can take a little longer sometimes. And I don't want the glue to sit for that long. So we're gonna go ahead and get these clamped up and then we'll move to the easy corners, which is the other end of the base. All right, just a little bit, get good coverage, squeeze it in, hold it in place. There we go. All right. Now, this is where it gets tricky. <laughs> See if I can do this. I, it's really, if I had three hands, it'd probably be easier. But uh, what I need to do is get this. There we go. It's a matter of getting your hand in the right position. And then start clamping. Sure that it stays like I said once again you want to make sure these blocks do not rise up off of the bottom of the box because then they'll sit your machine won't sit evenly on there because they're cut to fit with them sitting flush against the bottom of the box so if they rise up you got trouble all right one more right here let me get this sort of lined up and then I can sort of grab it with my hand here and get this, like I said, challenging, but we can do it. There we go. And same thing, you want this kind of about in the middle of the block of wood. You're just trying to distribute this clamping pressure across that block there. All right, that actually was much easier than I thought it was gonna be. Sometimes I can get them easy and sometimes I'll fiddle with those clamps for five minutes before I get them set. All right, I need two more block pieces. So there we go, just a couple blocks. Gonna sit right here. It's fine, I got two clamps. Get some glue on here. And then this part is done. We can set these aside and I'll pull these out this weekend. So this weekend is gonna be probably a lot of sanding for me. Um, Especially since I'm going to be sanding to 320, that's an added step from where I usually go. But um, I'm kind of excited about this finish, and I'm hoping that it really 
turns out really nice. I've seen nothing but good things about it, so I'm really very hopeful that we will get a very good finish on this stuff. And um, yeah, we'll see. Turn the brightness down again. The battery will go dead. But uh, I, I do like using a new finish usually, just you know, trying things out just to see how they work out. I normally wouldn't use that finish on like my cherry because I like to stain my cherry dark uh, so that it looks more of a walnut-y color, um, just more of a traditional, really super dark brown kind of look to them. But, uh, and then usually the walnut, I would use Danish oil, but I figured, you know, a lot of people use this Odie's oil for doing like walnut tabletops and such. So why not give it a try? Just something different. And um, it's supposedly, you know, really protective and good, food safe. So if you want to eat off of your base, you can. All right. Let me get this last clamp in place. Last clamps, plural. And then we can move on to uh, more fun stuff. Um, oh, so one thing I did also get this week um, was a new spiral flush trim bit, which is pretty nice. It's just a quarter inch one, um, but I all I had was straight blade uh, bits I, uh, for flush trim. I did not have any spiral bits. Oh, I got a little squeeze out. Let's get rid of that. Little squeeze out right here. Got rid of that. You all know the the straw clamp thing or the straw trick, right? So you use a straw and you run it down in your corners, and it basically just goes and grabs the glue and pulls it into the straw, conforms to the corner, and you get really super clean edges. This has saved me so much trouble. Um, cause I used to spend so much time just, um, using a chisel and knocking glue squeeze out, out of the corners and stuff. But I, I don't have that issue anymore cause I use a straw, little, little tiny one cent straw saves me so much work. All right. We are done with the clamping. I'm going to take the rest of these blocks and toss them up into my clamp box, my clamping bracket corner piece of wood box. Should come up with a name for that, right? Okay. Where are we now? Well, let's, uh, let's move on to something interesting, shall we? I think what I want to do is take my little sanding pad here and clean all of the shellac off of here. And we will break out our wood grain filler. Um, I don't know how long it takes for this stuff to dry. It says let dry 30 to 45 minutes and then sand it with a 320 or finer and then do another one. And it says only two or three coats are recommended. So you two probably Three, if you really need it, maybe three coats in areas where it's the most thick, or, or not the most thick, where you have the, the largest gaps in the grain would probably be acceptable. So I'm going to go ahead and move this over here. Let's go back over to the table over here. We're just going to work over here today. It's going to be my work surface. And I'm going to get my little sandy sponge out here. And I am going to... Like I said, just basically clean off the exterior and uh, get the schlack off the outside of this, which feels really nice and smooth now. And then I'm going to vacuum this out because I don't want any of this dust from the shellac dust. 
I don't want that to be filling the pores just yet. Um, we're going to this way. So yeah, we're going to uh, go ahead and uh, clean this out. And I actually have someone here. Let me get this cleaned out too. And the handles here. I don't know how I'm going to put any in the handles. And I may not worry about doing the grain filler in the handles. Just on these flat areas is really where I want the grain filler to be. And I'm just trying to look and see the surface. I'm trying to shine it in the light to make sure that it's all clean and satiny looking. Um, if I see any glossy spots, those are areas that need to be hit with the sanding pad again. And these are pretty nice. These are, I guess these are like the gray ones or whatever. Um, actually, I have these sitting here somewhere. Thought I did. Um, yeah. So this is a 3M very fine hand sanding pad. So that's what this is. Removes residue and blemishes. Uh, I don't know if it tells an approximate. Um, use these pads to, God, you know what? Do they know that people can't see anymore? To thoroughly clean surfaces of remaining residue prior to applying thin or oh, stain or finish. So there you go. So that's what these are for, is to basically just kind of remove any blemishes and so like if I've, if I've laid down lacquer coats, I normally don't sand between all my coats of lacquer because lacquer likes to build. So I like to let the lacquer build up. But usually between my last two coats, I do a scuff sand like this because it removes all the imperfections um, that you get in the uh, in the lacquer. Now, I, did I spray this on the bottom? I don't think I did. I don't think I sprayed the bottom of this. But I did spray the top because there are large pore openings here. So we want to make sure I got these. And the other thing is I couldn't decide whether I wanted to do the roundovers first or the grain filler first. I went with the grain filler first. I don't know why, I just did. So I'm gonna grain fill these, then I'm gonna round the edges, and then I'll give a final sanding to them once more. But I did not round these edges yet. Did I get, oh, I missed some spots here. But these are kind of cool pads because you can rinse them out, wash them, use them over and over and over again. This edge. And I'm still wondering if I should do that, that edge round over. Because if I open up an area that, uh, you know, just decisions, decisions, decisions. I haven't done anything except spray it with lacquer. So right now I'm, I'm wide open to be able to do whatever I want. Um, I did spray the inside of this as well. So I'm gonna hit those. These are gonna be harder to do, I think. But um, I'm gonna turn this in half and make it smaller to get inside this area right here. Everything smells like lacquer now. Or not lacquer, but uh, shellac. Very unique smell. Okay. This long edge. And I'm trying to go with the grain here. That's my. My goal is to go with the grain as I'm doing this. 
And I'm going to clean these. I did uh, also hit these corners. So I'm just going to give them a little scuff up here. They'll get waxed later. I'm not really worried about the corners. And like I said, the inside of the box really, you know, it is what it is. Um, I'm just going to give this a light scuff as well. I'm not going to grain fill the inside of the bottom. But it did get shellac on it, so I'm just getting that shellac wiped down on there. All right. <clears throat> Let me vacuum all this out. <clears throat> okay, so I've decided I'm going to do the roundovers on these first. Um, uh, you know, if I open up more of the pores after I have already done the grain filling, that would probably be counterproductive. So it just makes sense, I think, to do it now. And um, trust notification. Oh, okay, no big deal. Um, yeah, so anyway, I think that's probably the way I'm going to go with this is just, uh, yeah, do the round over, which means we need to go over here to the table and put in a little round over bit, which means I can show you my other bit too that I got. So hang on, let me grab this. It's just over here in my bit storage. It's my favorite bit of all. I use this bit more than any other bit. I'm going to remove the spiral flush trim bit that I have in here, which worked really well. So what happened was uh, on one of those uh, Charcuterie boards, I was using the CNC to cut it out. My board tape came loose, the double-sided tape that was holding it down came loose, and the bit had gone through and done about half the cut around the perimeter, and then it spiraled out of the board. And instead of trying to re-tack it down and redo it and try to get it to land in the exact right position, I just went ahead and cut it loosely around the cut that had been made with my bandsaw. And then I used this little flush trim bit, which is very cool, spiral flush trim. So I used this to basically use the bearing to co go around the area that had already been cut as a guide and then cleaned up all of the rough edge that I did with the bandsaw. And it worked like a charm. So happy with that. And oh, it only costs like 25 bucks. So not super expensive, but I do need to find a place to put this. So we'll put this back here. There we go. <clears throat> all right, and we will install this. We're gonna have to use this on all these other bases as well. Um, like I said, I normally don't do the round over until I've done some significant sanding, but this has been significantly sanded. So we're not going to worry about destroying the roundover profile by using that sanding sponge or anything else that's super fine. We're just going to get this set up and lock that in. And then I just need to get a piece of wood and check 
to make sure that we're going to have this profile in the right place. So I just want this to slide under the blade or over, I'm sorry, over the blade. So I just lower it down until it's just, there you go, just over that blade. All right, this is going to be really fast. It does not take long for me to do these. Um, so I'm just going to go around the bottom. I'm going to go around the, uh, the top and then I'm going to go around the inside. So three passes over that quick really shouldn't take too long. Um, <clears throat> let me plug this in and oh, we're good. Okay. I need some ears, 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 ears. There we go. All right, and just enough to break that profile edge, you know, it's soft in the hand, feels good. That's really all we're after. Nothing spectacular. Um, now, one thing I need to do on these, I'm looking for an old piece of sandpaper here. Um, actually, I could just use this. This is pretty good. This is 150. I need to break the edge on these handles before I do this as well. Just, they've got a sharp edge and we, nobody likes to grab a sharp edge like that. So I'm just cleaning these off with some sandpaper. This is like 150 grit. Um, it's not on the flat, smooth surfaces. It's just on these edges to break that edge and make it more comfortable to hold. Just like that. And then we'll do the same thing over here. Um, this is something I do on all the bases. 
Um, it's I can't get that quarter or that eighth inch bit inside of this little dugout here for the hands. It just doesn't fit. So in order to do this, we just kind of break them, break the edges by hand, and it's not hard to do. Uh, like I said, a little 150 usually works well for this. And then I can come back and if I want to like grab a, a 220 or something and just smooth it down a little bit more, just to kind of take any 150 scratches out of there. there go. And I'll do the same thing over here. Basically same thing, just kind of Take that down, okay. Alrighty, so now we are ready to, I'm gonna vacuum this out one more time, and then we're gonna grain fill, and that'll be something new. Okay, that is done. And now I need my grain filler. And I need, I think, I think we're okay. I'm gonna get one of these little Bondo spreaders. I'm just gonna get the small one. Should be just fine. And uh, these are kind of nice because they're, they're a little flexible. Um, but stiff enough to really kind of work stuff in. The way this stuff works is you get it on here and you basically just spread it. Let me get some on here. And you go across the grain, spreading it across the grain. I actually should be using the other side of the Bondo spreader, which is the flat edge. But you just take this stuff and you work it across the grain to get it into the nooks and crannies and all of the grain surfaces here. So that's what we're gonna do. Just kind of try to squeeze out here, go across. Fill these in best we can. And this is where it gets hard because I've got these corners here, but I do want to get the corners filled in as well. Fill in these large areas, make sure that these large open areas really get saturated and filled up for moving on to this corner. So this is not hard to do. <laughs> Um, this stuff spreads really easily. And uh, we're just gonna, just, and it doesn't take a lot, just a little teeny bit goes a long way. This is the way that they, they suggest doing it, going across the grain. Like I said, I'm not going inside the handholds or anything else. This is not finish. All this is, is filling those grain areas because what we want left over after the fact is a nice smooth wood surface. And like right now I can feel all of this openness in this grain structure right there. And it's not really pleasant to feel. So that's what we want to get rid of. I'm going to come around this corner. The corners are a little hard, they're a little tricky. We're just going to come around those corners, okay, onto this surface. Get some more spread in here. Bunch on here, so we'll just try to work it all in. Yeah, the bottom spreader is pretty good. I, I that's a good. Uh, Good call on my part to use the Bondo spreader. I am definitely gonna have to do two coats on this. Um, this was the, th the more open, gaping 
area of this particular board was on the back, I guess. We'll call this the back. Depends on which way you want it to face. But once we get it filled up, it won't really matter. Just make sure that I'm getting it squeezed into all of that area. And get this corner here. I've got a lot on right here just because these corners, I want to make sure that I'm getting these corners really well. And then uh, I think the last step on here is to go with the grain and scrape off the remnants and then you let it dry. So once you go across the grain like this, then you go with the grain, scrape off any extra, let it dry, and then give it another sand. All right, I'm gonna to try to do all of this at once here. What's that? A little fleck on here, get off there. All right, so let me see if I can get these areas on here. On the top. Scoop off the extra, put it here, and just keep working my way around. There's not a lot of openness on this top here, which is nice. I think the other one, the other base has more open area on the top of it. So we'll, we'll see when we get to that. But there's a bit here. Scrape off here. There we go. Yeah, the edges are definitely challenging just because there's not a lot of surface to work with, but it's okay. I think we got this. I think we got this. And then I'll do the inside pieces, which will be a little bit more challenging to do, but Um, we really want to make sure that we're getting full coverage on this. So I'm just going to squeeze it in and then run it across. And like I said, the inside pieces don't have to be, I'm not as critical about these sections, but there are a couple of large gaping areas in that grain that I would like to get filled up as best as possible here. My flat side. This is my flat side. So we're just going to run this across. And then we will flip it and we're just going to keep doing this in these areas in here. Actually, this is pretty easy on, especially on large flat areas. It's pretty easy. Not hard. Not hard to do. I am curious how this stuff is going to work out. I'll definitely give this stuff like an hour to set up because um, of the depth of some of these open pore areas. Um, I want to give this stuff a chance to really set up and dry. Okay, last section here. There we go. All right, and I'm just gonna scrape off what I've got left here in my jar. I think, and then let me make sure. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, work filler generously and with pressure against the grain with a small squeegee bondo blade right here, or Old credit card 
or a clean cotton rag with the grain. It just says with the grain. So not really great directions. But anyway, I think what they're saying is go against the grain, fill it, get it all done, then go with the grain, scoop it all off like this. We're going to go with the grain, just make sure that we've got all this cleaned off. So I'm going to go all around the perimeter here because I've got some extra on here as well. Get this all clean. Then we'll go here, get a little extra here. There we go. Getting this extra stuff pulled off of here. And then finally, we'll clean off the interior here. Get that cleaned out. And then all that's left for this is to basically dry, to get set up and dry. That's pretty good though. I'm not unhappy with this. Um, there are several woods that I use that are open pour woods. Um, red oak is notoriously open poured. White oak, notoriously open poured. Um, even walnut can be open poured and you can have issues with walnut as well. So, you know, depending on how crazy you want to go with this, you can, you know, go to these woods that are considered open poured woods and use this stuff and fill in. Now, I, like I said, I can see on here, I'm looking, um, I'll give you a view here, but I can see some areas like in this area right over here where it did fill in, but it's not totally filled in, which is why we would want to do this a second time. But this will create a much smoother surface for us to lay down our finish. OK, so what I need to do with this is I'm going to go put it on some painting pyramids that I have over here and just let it set. What time is it now? It is 12.30, so by 1.30, I can come back and sand that thing off, and it'll be ready to roll. Um, now, I can't move forward with this other one until I get it sanded. And unfortunately for you, I think that's where we're gonna go next, because you know what? As much as I don't want to have to let you watch me sand, I really don't have anything else to do, but sand. So really this is gonna be, I mean, I've kind of got all these little bits and pieces that need to be done. We've got the corners glued in. We've got, uh, we, we've got, uh, you know, I can't do my epoxy stuff because I can't find my black stain. Um, I can't clean out my finger holes because I haven't received my sandpaper yet. Um, kind of in that holding pattern for quite a few things. So all that we can do is the stuff that we can do, which is unfortunately sanding. Now I'm going to have to do grain filler, like I said, on this, uh, this other base. Let me grab this base right here. So I am going to have to do grain filler on this other base right here. Um, just like we just did. And this one, once again, is a very, um, very open poured zebra wood. I'm looking to see if I can find, I don't have a lot of areas on this one. This one's a little bit better, um, but there are a couple of spots, one right here, one right here that are notoriously open grained. Um, and you can see, it's hard to see those spots, but they're there. Um, those dark spots, they're like little tiny chasms. There's a lot of it right up here on the edge. So right here on this particular edge right here, where that opening is right on the corner there, and there's nothing I can really do about that. Um, but when I go to do the roundovers, that'll take care of some of that. And then the grain filler will hopefully take care of the rest of it. This area, not too bad. But yeah, there's a, there's a, a significant amount of, um, of openness to this grain that just needs to be addressed. Now on these lids, this thing has a ton of it right in through here. There's a ton of that open grain structure right here. It's a lid, but I want it to be smooth. So we will, I'm trying to get the light to shine in there. 
so you can see, but I can't get it to be shiny in the places where we want it to be. Yeah, oh well, not important. Uh, what is important, I've got another one right here. So these will all get grain filled as well, but they also need to be sanded and sanded down to our acceptable tolerances there. You know, my guitar teacher is really funny. I've got a three o'clock guitar lesson on Fridays, every Friday, three o'clock. And every day at about like 1230, he's like, hey, what time do you want to go today? <laughs> like, well, we've got a three o'clock appointment, don't we? But uh, anyway, he's, he's, he's the nicest guy in the world and I love him. He's great. I've been going to him for years and we're buddies and such, but I just think that's funny. It's like, what time do you want to go for your three o'clock appointment? I don't know, three o'clock? <laughs> we, we actually do end up going early some days. So. All right, I need a pencil. I need, uh, I need sandpaper. I'm going to need this sandpaper, actually. This is 80 grit. I'm going to clean this off. I hope my power doesn't go out again. You know what I'm going to do? Hang on a second. I know mean, it's not much, but I'm going to turn off one little set of lights here. It's not going to affect you, hopefully. Just add a little drama. Add a little drama. But every little bit that I don't... Ooh, look at that. Now we're just right here. Every little bit that I don't suck out of the power there is gonna be more successful for me to not have the lights go out. Like I said, normally, normally that's only a thing when I actually have the, um, when, I, when I have the, uh, whatchamacallit, the heater running. But uh, I don't know why I did that today. All right, I need to, oh, this is a pain. I gotta switch my dust port. I was using my fine oscillating sander for doing some 320 sanding, but I need to put this over on the Bosch sander so we can do some larger sanding, which means I gotta take it off of this one. And then we're gonna put it onto this one. So, yeah, and this one has a larger opening, which means I have to loosen the screw up more to get this rubber piece to fit on here. And then after that's on, I come back and I tighten this up. Hose clamps are great. I highly recommend them. I need to go onto Rockler and order a new hose. The rubber pieces, and actually my hose broke, so it's actually Gorilla glued onto here. We're our Gorilla taped. I mean, it works, but it's not ideal. So I should just spend the 35 bucks and get a new hose. Although I really hate to spend 35 bucks for a hose, but it is what it is. You know, things go bad in the shop and you got to fix them and do that. Let me check chats real quick. Okay. I am a solo act on Friday. Wah. All right. That's a 150. This is an 80. I'm going to start with the 80. And then we will move to a 120 after that. And I'm going to clamp this sucker down because it just works better when I clamp this to the surface. I need to find my pencil. I'm just going to put some pencil mark on here. We can go to this one, I guess, maybe. I'm going to put some pencil mark on here just so that I can have visual reference of what I have and have not sanded on here. So I just squiggle lines on here, basically is all I do. It's gonna squiggle some lines and you can, I would try to show them to you, but you won't see them. They're not that dark, but they're dark enough for, for me to see them. Uh, I'm gonna take a clamp and we're gonna clamp this to the table because th this sander, I need both hands to work this sander. It just, it's just that big. All right, last thing we need is to find the 12 foot long cord end. This thing has an extremely long cord. And it doesn't help that I have like two cords hanging out here right now for two different sanders. There we go. All right, a little better now, a little more organized under the table. And now it's time for you to watch me sand. I'm sorry, it just is what it is. 
I'll just, I, this should hopefully go smooth. Um, we did those round over, so I definitely need to get that, those smoothed out. And I mean, I can just feel that, that roughness. It feels so bad. Let's make it feel better. sandpaper with like a lot more holes in it um, because I, I could get better dust extraction that way I'm pretty sure all right um, I'm having to work on those corners because I did use that round over but because it's that round over I need a new one but it also it did all this very open grain end grain right here and so these corners right here are pretty rough and that 80 grit does a nice job of just smoothing things out and getting those corners to feel much, much nicer. So I will spend a bit of time on those corners as we move forward here, just to make sure that we're getting them as smooth as possible. It's 
also really challenging to keep them square and rolling over flat because they kind of want to, it's big and it wants to move. So kind of hard to keep it square that way sometimes. All right. Um, I don't need the 80 there. I am going to hit the top here with some 80 real quick. Uh, do I need to? I think, yeah, some of these areas just need it. Oh, God. Ow, son of a gun. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Definitely needs it. I'm going to just clamp this edge and then um, I'll move to the other. I'll do this part and then I'll move my clamp and do this part. So. Um. All right, I, I, I'm not going to hit these with 80. They're not that rough. I, I, when I was smoothing them down to fit, um, they're, they're good enough for right now. <clears throat> I don't want to go to, <clears throat> excuse me. I don't want to go too much on those because, yeah, I just don't want to. Um, I think what I'm going to do is, well, I'm going to switch this to a 120 from that 80. I'll do a 120 on here. Um, and do I have one here that is decent to use? Because the problem is, once you use these things, they start to feel like uh, about the next two grits finer. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
That's feeling a lot better after 120. Um, it's going to get better than that as we go. Um, said so I will probably, well, I won't probably. I'll do a 150 after this. Um, but they go faster once you get them pretty smooth. Like after 80, the rest of them go pretty smoothly. Um, and they go faster because you're working with a finer and finer surface. So it takes less time to get that pencil mark off of there. Yeah, I'm just looking to make sure there's no hard line. It should be a smooth transition to those corners. And uh, so sometimes I'll just kind of go over them a few more times there. I also had a couple little areas where I had a tear out and I had addressed it with a um, with a cabinet scraper, but still a little rough. So I just wanted to make sure I hit those with the sandpaper and the a um, little bit more coarse grits so that I uh, made sure that they are nice and smooth moving onto the fine grits. All right, I'm going to go ahead and do the top of this thing. And then we will move to, that's not very, that's not very stout. Hang on a second. Ugh. I got to find a way to secure the little rubber feet to these clamps because 
I love these clamps, but the little rubber feet fall off all the time. And it drives me kind of crazy. You get insane clamping power with them, but man, those rubber feet. All right, I'm gonna grab a fresh 150 for this. Um, and uh, which feels actually more coarse now than the 120 I just used, which needs to go in the garbage. But um, anyway, this is the 150 after this. Um, we're gonna go up to 220 and a 320. I'll switch sanders, I think, for the, the finer ones. I'm not going to use the big sander for the finer ones. I will definitely switch. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and hit this since I've got it clamped down already.
I, I don't remember what the last grit was I sanded those tops to, but since I have the 150, it's a little bit more aggressive, I can make sure that they're going to fit inside of this enclosure a little bit better if I need to just kind of finesse an edge or whatever, just to get it a little bit more flush. That's what I was doing. But um, honestly, it's pretty, pretty close now. And... Um, as I move to a 220 and a 320, I will just sand those outside of the base um, because pretty much I'm not gonna be taking any more material off of these, I mean, minimal to the point where you couldn't measure it. Uh, okay, so this is all done. And let me get this done to 150 and then I'm gonna switch sanders to my other oscillating sander and move to the 220. Also spend a little extra time right here on these corners because that's end grain. And so the more attention I give to that, the better it will turn out in the long run, um, just because of the, the nature of end grain itself. It just needs a little bit more, a little bit more polish than, than the long grain does. All right, last side, then we can move on to the other sander. Thank you. 
That's that. Um, now, well, hang on before I put this away. I have to loosen this one. Um, and then we will put this on the other sander. But actually, let me do two things. One, let me uh, just gather this cord because, like I said, it is 12 feet long and just wraps them out of my feet like an anaconda down there. And uh, I do not need any more tripping hazards in my shop than I currently already have. So I'm just gonna take this cord. I have a little scrap that I can tie that up with. So there you go. So that's all, that's all bound up and I can put this underneath here and then um, kind of just get this out of the way. Grab this other one right here, my little Ryobi. It's a POS, but you know what? It, it, it works, I guess. It does what it's supposed to do. Um, just not great at it. And it's on. Oops, there we go. And sometimes that happens where it's on and I don't want it to be on. That's a 320 on there. I needed a 220, which I should have a fresh one up here that I used, where are you? Fresh 220, where did you go? Oh well, damn, I just had a fresh 220 on here. Um, that's three, and I don't know where it went to, unless I just grabbed it and used it for, I did, I used that. <laughs> that's what I used to soften the edges. So I'll be grabbing another 220, oh well, it's only money, right? I try to get utility out of my sanding discs, but at the end of the day, these are disposables and it goes into the cost of what you're making. So if you use a lot, charge more. All right, a nice fresh 220 on here. I'm gonna put the uh, hose and the clamp on here. So the problem is, see the hose, it, it fits, but it, it, it's kind of loosey-goosey. You can't see that. Um, it's it's loose, so it fits on, but it's it's just loose. So in order to keep it on there, take my hose clamp, and then I take the hose clamp and tighten that, and then the hose clamp holds on and keeps it in place, no matter which sander that I'm using. And um, there we go. And just keeps that from coming off, and then we're good to go. All right, let me uh, mark this thing up with some more pencil. And uh, I don't really need the clamp on here anymore, but I guess I can use it while it's clamped. I'll just go ahead and use it while it's clamped. Doesn't matter.
Okay, so 
that's 220. Um, but before I go on, I'm going to do the edges, just like we did on the last one with the roundover bit. So I need to set that up really quickly right here. And grab my uh, little scale that got knocked off here. Um, so we need to get that set up, and then we will uh, do all those edges with the roundover real quick, which I just said, but I said it again. And then um, uh, it'll be ready for some 320 sanding, and then I can do the first coat of uh, of the aqua coat to fill the grain. So you know, that's the that's the process now. All of these other ones are going to get the same sanding process, but they're not going to get the grain sealer. That's why I want to go ahead and do this one first because it needs that grain filler. All right, you go ahead and get this on and. We don't need this 220 anymore. And you know what I'm going to do is I'm just going to refine that that edge we just did with the the uh, roundover bit. I'm just going to refine that just a little bit. Um, just in some of these areas where it just it's hard to get that bit in the perfect position, just because there's so many different angles that are trying to rest on the table. But that feels pretty good. I'm just anywhere where there's just maybe a hint of a, a sharper line. You just want to take that out. And then uh, we can, like I said, we can do the, the 320. And then we can go on to the grain filler, which time is it? Honestly, I don't know if I need to do the grain filler right now or not. Uh, I might wait until later to do that since we've already seen that anyway. This definitely has some from areas that need the grain filler though. Sometimes you get a little scuffing when you run this around the table. You get a little scuffing on some of the flat areas too. So I wanna make sure that those get cleaned up before I go to that next grip. That looks pretty good. The bottom feels nice. I'm just gonna run around the, the edge here. 
And then I also need to do those handles. Remember that last time we did the handles. So I'm gonna do those again as well. But I need to switch to that 120 pad or that 150 pad for that. Looks pretty good on that ingrain. All right, I'm gonna find that 150 I just took off. And where did I put you? I just throw stuff around. It's like willy nilly, oh, here. Zh, zh, zh. And then when I think about it, I'm like, oh, you know, I really could have used that. Is that it? That's it right there. Okay. And I'm gonna just ease these hand holes once again. To make it a little bit nicer on the hand. Don't wanna change the profile or anything. Just take the sharp edges off. And they get a little bit sharp in the corners too. So I kinda, of, well, I like these cause they're a little bit rounded on the edge, these little sanding mice. So they're a little bit rounded on the edge and help me get into that little curved profile area. But they're also stiff across the face, pretty stiff. So I can get a pretty good standing job done here. And then I'll come back with that 220 that I had used right here. And just smooth that up. This again with the 220. All right, I think we're good. Blech. Dust everywhere. Very dusty day in the shop today. All right, and we need a 320 on that. That's okay. I'll come and do that and later. Um, I want to grab. Yeesh, my hands are dusty. Well, I guess it doesn't matter if my hands are dusty because we're gonna we're gonna hit this thing with a pad anyway. But I just want to see how our grain fill looks here. So let me. Uh, Get a little light shining on here and see there's some areas right in through here that definitely need a little bit more uh, right up in here this area I did pretty well all things being equal this was probably the worst area it's not bad so I think one more one more should get us there I'm gonna look at the inside really quick I think we're there. So I'm gonna bring this over here and I'm just gonna grab my sanding rubbery pad here. And the reason I bring this over is I don't want to scratch the surface of the wood. Now I just wanna work on getting this stuff sanded off here. Let's see how this works. That actually works pretty well. About the same as the uh, shellac in terms of removal. Not bad. Cool.
there. It's corners. Hit this with the vacuum real quick and see what that looks like. Stand a little bit more sanding on there. Um, you know what I might do is I've got a 320 pad here. I might put this on, <clears throat> I've got another, somewhere around here is another sanding mouse. Here it is. So I'm gonna hit this with some 320 paper instead of this sanding pad. And let's see how that works. Because I can keep this nice profile here. I think that probably works a little better. But I can tell you these are going to be silky smooth when they are done. This is really nice. So I think I'll start with this pad and then end with the 320 is probably my fastest way of doing it. This just kind of gets the rough stuff off the top and then the 320 finishes it off. I think that'll probably work best. Yeah, and then there's just a little bit of glossy stuff left on here. We'll hit that with the pad here. Cause I really want to make sure that I'm keeping these corners nice and square and flat for the most part. Anywhere where I see any extra here. Good. Okay. So here's the thing about finishing. It takes a long time. To do it right, to get a really nice finish, you can't rush it. I mean, you could, yeah, you could just say, well, you know, slap on some, some wipe on polyurethane, you know, give a little scuff coat and you're done. You could do that. But if you want something that really kind of stands out and looks really good, you got to put in the work. There's just no way around it. You got to put the hours in. You got to spend the time with, you know, the orbital sander and the sanding pads and going through all the grits and making sure that, you know, you're getting all those areas clean and smooth. Because otherwise you're just wasting your time. You're always going to have something that looks okay instead of something that looks amazing. If you want amazing, you got to put the time in. Oof, you got to get a new piece of paper too.
We've got one more side to do here. And I still have the insides and the top to do on this one. And that's why I said, this just takes a while. It's just putting in the time and the effort. I'm not sure what up with that. Little area right there. But I really want to make sure that we're getting it all done. This, I'm about ready to, oop, wrong one. Move on to a new pad of paper here. Some of this may actually be the, uh, could actually be the shellac. It smells like shellac on some of this stuff. So we just thought I did a pretty good job of getting that shellac off, but maybe not super good. All right. I still have what time is it is 135, so we're good. Um, we can we can put a put a bow on this thing and wrap it up. Um, so what we've got here is a nice start to a grain fill. Still a couple of pockets that definitely need a little bit more. And it even says in the instructions, you know, you need to probably do two at least two coats, um, no more than three. And this will definitely take two, because I definitely, especially this side right here, I'm looking at it. You can't see it, unfortunately, but if you were able to look down and see the light shining off here, you'd see the openings in the green structure right through here in this area, where it's very dark, that dark ribbon going through there, that's where the really large openings are. A little bit right here. Um, but a little bit on this side. So, you know, uh, still have the whole inside that needs to be sanded and needs to be cleaned out and the top. And then I'm gonna go over this one more time. I may not grain fill the inside again. I may just leave that the way it is. Um, because like I said, I really, the, the outside, and, and this feels so amazing right now, it feels so super smooth. I just want those few little areas right in here and uh, right back here to get filled in. And then this will be, this will be an amazing feeling piece of wood right here, which from where it started, like from this wood right here to this one, um, before it was sanded, uh, wow just night and day. This thing feels like, and it's just got, I mean, just looking down the light, it's, it's really, it's just beautiful wood. Um, it really is. Okay. Plans for the weekend. Who has plans for the weekend? I apparently have a lot of things planned for the weekend. <sighs> my weekends are just stupid. Um, but then again, my weekends are kind of like my weekdays. They all sort of run together. Uh, I, I don't really have a separation between my days. So my plans are I'm going to get the larger box right here. We're going to get this one sanded to 320. Since we've already done the, uh, the roundovers on there, we're going to sand it to 320. Then I will do my first, uh, well, actually, then what I will do is I'll spray it with shellac, let that dry, and uh, probably for a couple hours. Shellac dries in about 15 to 20 minutes. I'll let it dry for a couple of hours just to be sure that it's dry. I'll sand off the shellac on the outer edges and I'll apply my first coat of the aqua coat. This one will get uh, finished sanding off the inner portions, clean that out, and then I'm going to apply a second coat of the aqua coat on here. Let that dry. When that gets done, I will sand that off. When the other one gets done, I'll clean it off and come back and do a second coat of the aqua coat on that. So these are gonna get 
um, aqua coat number two, aqua coat number one, and number two. And then they will be ready. Once, that, once those two aqua coats are done and everything's sanded, these will be ready for finish. The other bases that I have, like this one right over here, and these two over here, and the two on the ground that were being glued, their corners are being glued in, all of those need to have the entire sanding process done. So I will start, depending on the wood species, probably start with 120, 150, 220. I don't have any 180. I can't find any 180. So 220, 320, and then they'll be done. But in between the, after the 150, I'll do the roundovers on all those, then do the 220 and the 320. So those uh, will all be ready for some stain as well. The other thing I'm going to be doing this weekend is going to my local woodcraft store in uh, Springfield. So it's about 40 minutes, 35-ish to 40 minutes a drive, depending on what time I go. Maybe I'll go this afternoon. I might do that this afternoon. Um, but anyway, I need to go there and um, get some more black dye stain since I can't seem to find my bottle of black dye stain. So I'm going to get more black dye stain. I need to mix uh, a batch of epoxy and do all the letters on those charcuterie boards and get all that epoxy set up. I would like to be able to sand all of that epoxy off next Monday or so. Um, if I can get them all sanded and clean and sanded next Monday, I also want to do eighth inch roundovers on them too, but I'm not going to do that until I actually get them sanded flat and such. But when I get them sanded and everything, I will be doing everything here in the Odie's oil. And that will be a new experience for me. So we will do some Odie's oil. We will finish all of these in Odie's. It's amazing. Just, okay, so if you look at the difference in the wood tone, this is basically been hit with the shellac and the aqua coat. I think the color coming from the shellac. So look at the color difference between these two. This was the same board, by the way. All of these came out of the same board. So if you look at how pale this is compared to this, um, and then look at the interior. I don't know if you can see the interior of this or not very well, but the is very yellowish, um, kind of a amber hue to it. So who knows what this is going to do when I put the Odie's oil on there. I'm really interested to see that. Um, I'm dying to see it on the Sapelli because that stuff has this beautiful chatoyance with the Cortison stuff. The Paduk should really just pop and come alive, um, just be vibrant and orange and look really good. Walnut just always looks amazing. So anyway, oh, and the other thing I might do on the Walnut, because Walnut gets really dark and I've got this engraving on here, is sometimes what I will do is um, I tape this off and hit this with black spray paint, just a light coat of black spray paint, just to get the lettering to pop. And then um, I'll spray the whole thing with shellac first. Then I'll do it to uh, get it to pop. And then I'll sand it off so that the black is only left in the lettering. And that looks really nice once this thing is finished. It makes it stands out from that darker walnut color. Um, but as you can see, I have lots to do. So the biggest thing for me is to try to stay organized and try to stay on top of my steps and what needs to happen. Um, those things will come out of clamps. Once I get those out of clamps, I'll put them with the others. And then from there, it's just a matter of, okay, everybody gets a 120, everybody gets a 150, you know, I can go through like that. These are the ones that are kind of different and set aside from there. Anyway, that's my plans. I'm going to be doing a lot of sanding. I'm going to be doing a lot of grain filling. I'm going to be doing some epoxy work, hopefully. And, uh, and then more sanding. And, and then hopefully next week we'll be putting the Odie's oil on. And I will do that in front of you all because it's a really cool process. It does not take long to do. Um, and I think that would be kind of fun to share that process with you all. So that's what we were going to do on Monday. I'll be doing some finishing um, this weekend. I'm going to be working my butt off trying to get some stuff done. I think next week, well, it's Thanksgiving week, but I think next week, uh, maybe Tuesday, I'm going to make a trip to my hardwood dealer to see about getting me some, I'd like to get eight quarter walnut. It may be six quarter. We'll see. Six quarter is an inch and a half. Eight quarter is two inches. Um, I would like to get some, some 
eight quarter walnut and start working on that cherry crotch live edge um, table that I have. I want to make the legs for that and I'm going to need some wood for that. And I want it to be nice and thick and stout wood. Um, I'm hoping that's about a $700 table when it's done. So we'll see. But uh, I have work to do on that. So that may be what I work on after all these things get Odie's oiled. <laughs> Uh, is that I may take a break from the bases for a little bit. My shop will be full of bases and um, keep the customers happy. And then I can go do some personal projects like that that have been sitting in the corner for a long time. I think that's my next step is to work on that. Um, get my Christmas presents done, get the bases done, and then I'm free to do that kind of stuff for a little bit. I also have a guitar neck I need to shape. I haven't worked on that in a while. So anyway, that's where we're at. That's what we're going to do. And uh, right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sign off. So you have a great weekend. Come back and see me on Monday. All right. Until then, um, be excellent to each other and I will see you later.